Item number, SCP-600. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-600 is contained in a Class E suite in Site-17. Dimensions 15 meters by 15 meters by 3 meters. Two security cameras monitor the subject at all times. A standard steel door with a reinforced double-paned window secures the suite. No special procedures are required for entering or exiting the suite, with the caveat that SCP-600 may attempt to follow researchers out of containment. A simple reprimand in order to return to containment has proved sufficient to curtail this behavior. Description SCP-600 is a humanoid entity, approximately 1.7 meters tall, with a build approximating an adult human male of average weight for its height. The subject is generally featureless, lacking facial features, external ears, nails, body hair, genitalia, and anus. Full-body scans have shown SCP-600 to have no internal structures of any kind, instead being formed from an unknown material of uniform density, close to that of human muscle tissue. It neither ingests, respirates, nor excretes. The subject's age has not been determined. SCP-600 telepathically affects all humans who view it, causing it to take on their superficial personal characteristics. This effect only alters the visual perception of the affected persons. SCP-600's actual form can still be detected by cameras, sensors, and touch. The perceived resemblance between SCP-600 and an affected viewer is general and superficial. No viewers have found it to be notable or uncanny in any way. Characteristics imitated by the subject include, but are not limited to, hair color, skin color, eye color, approximate age, clothing style, and general physique. Note that clothing imitated by SCP-600 is entirely illusory. Animal tests reveal that non-human organisms appear not to perceive the subject unless they physically collide with it. When humans are present, SCP-600 will attempt to engage in conversation. Its conversational repertoire is limited. It will discuss trivialities, such as weather and other small talk, or attempt to commiserate with those present about professional matters, as if it were similarly employed. Such discussions are superficial, filled with jargon appropriate to the person's area of expertise but consist largely of obvious statements and platitudes. Attempts at more substantial discussion are deflected, and SCP-600 displays no deep domain knowledge of any field of employment. When not in the presence of humans, SCP-600 is generally inactive, standing in a single pose for hours or even days at a time, without any apparent reaction to outside stimulus. The subject is generally uncooperative, but displays an unsettling tendency to refer to itself in the third person when speaking to researchers assigned to it, frequently referring to the SCP-600 case. See attached interview log 600E for an example of this behavior. It has requested that researchers refer to it as George, but is not upset by refusal to do so. Interview 600E Researcher Good morning, SCP-600. Today we are going to be performing some tests of your recall abilities. SCP-600 Hey, no need to be so formal. I told you before, just call me George. Researcher I don't think that would be appropriate. SCP-600 Ah, uh, always the consummate professional. Anyway, how are the kids doing? Must be getting pretty big now. Researcher I am not going to discuss that with you. Now, if you would please look at the four images on this page. SCP-600 Oh, that's cool. Let's get down to business. Say, uh, what are your thoughts on the SCP-600 case? He's certainly an odd one. Not that we haven't seen our share of odd ones. <laughs> Personally, I think the containment procedures are a little lax. Researcher Please try to focus on the exercise. Now, in the first picture, SCP-600. Do you think his ability is mimetic? Wasn't Dr. R's team looking into that? 
Researcher, if you are unable to focus on the matter at hand, I will be forced to discontinue this exercise. SCP-600. Oh, sorry. It's just such a fascinating case. Do you want to get a beer after work? I have some theories I'd like to bounce off of you. I have a suspicion that is tied up in this somehow. Researcher, this exercise is over. Item number, SCP-610. Object class, Keter. Special containment procedures. Due to the vast area of infection SCP-610 covers, containment is impossible. Isolation of the area has proved far more effective, and permission has been granted by the Russian government to establish a perimeter to keep people out of these areas under the guise of military operations. Should any organism displaying traits consistent with SCP-610 be sighted near this perimeter, then the established protocol requires it be engaged at range with small arms until immobile, then dispatched using incendiary weapons and munitions from as great a distance as possible. Any living thing coming in physical contact with an organism infected with SCP-610 is considered expendable and is to be immediately terminated and incinerated. Any persons coming within three meters of SCP-610 infected life are to be immediately withdrawn from the area, be isolated from the rest of their team, and subjected to medical examination using only remote techniques to determine if infection has occurred and appropriate steps taken based on that determination. At present, the known infection vectors for SCP-610 spread seem to be focused on physical contact. Drone movements within heavily infected areas have returned air samples containing minute particulate, which, when exposed to organic compounds, will result in the spread of SCP-610. The results of these particular tests have revealed that most require several days to manifest, if at all, with the exception of direct contact with exposed lung and liver tissue. These particular tests show a rapid rate of growth, which requires incineration of the testing environment no more than 24 hours after initial exposure, with even a two-hour mishap risking a compromised facility event. Given that this kind of rapid growth only occurs in organic material existing outside the human body, this form of infection is currently considered a minor concern. These peculiarities have given rise to a series of questions regarding the possible origin of the infection in conjunction with the failed data expunged. Containment protocol remains at a scorched earth policy at this time and no concern for transmission via water or air at infection parameters exists barring situational changes in the field. Description Initial reports of SCP-610 came direct from the Russian government through undisclosable channels. These reports consisted primarily of disappearances of farmers in the region and were not considered until the local police, followed by the regional police, and finally a government-dispatched agent, all failed to report in within a 72-hour period. A small military contingent was dispatched to the area and quickly withdrew, at which point the Foundation was contacted to investigate. The area SCP-610 affects is close to Lake Baikal in southern Siberia. Areas of known infection are marked on a map provided to us here. Containment perimeters are marked in blue, surrounding these infection areas, and as of present, no further locations have been identified. Incursions into the perimeter must be reported prior to conducting, confirmed during exploration, and debriefed on immediately following return. SCP-610 appears to be a contagious skin disease at first, with symptoms including rash, itching, and increased skin sensitivity. Within three hours, the disease will cause blemishes resembling heavy scar tissue to form in the chest and arm areas, spreading to the legs and back within an additional hour, consuming the victim completely within five hours. Exposure to higher temperatures vastly decreases the time for the contagion to spread, and complete infections 
have been recorded occurring in as little as five minutes. After the completion of the infection occurs, the victim's life functions will cease for approximately three minutes, after which time they will restart at two to three times the activity rate of a normal human. Following this, the scar tissue on the victims will start to move of its own accord and grow at a rapid rate. Normal human features start to disappear at this point under the infection, and the path of mutation appears to be largely random. Subjects observed in this stage of infection have been recorded as growing three or more limbs of a type, such as arms or legs. The head may become misshapen and elongate or widen out, and parts of the subject may split open, from which additional branches of flesh will grow. The duration of this stage of infection is unknown, and not all subjects appear to progress to the later stages. Under unknown conditions, an infected individual will cease moving and place itself in a location it deems suitable, where it roots itself. The fleshy growth on the victim will then begin to spread itself across all surrounding objects and consume them. Such objects do not spread the infection as living creatures do, however, and the effect of prolonged contact with these objects is recorded later in this document. It is assumed that this behavior is to create an area hospitable to continued growth of the other infected. Observation of life infected by SCP-610 by staff is impossible. Those infected with the disease immediately seek out aid as natural human impulse, resulting in unintended infections. Those infected past the scar tissue phase actively and aggressively attempt to infect anyone approaching them within an undefined area. It has been established that should an infected be capable of sight and observe an uninfected, it will proceed toward them. If the infected has lost the ability of sight, a range of approximately 30 meters is considered safe. Observation of SCP-610 infected settlements has been established using artificial methods such as remote robots. The data returned from these observations coupled with the openly aggressive nature of the infected to attempt to spread SCP-610, has resulted in the Keter classification. However, so long as nothing is allowed to enter or leave the infected areas, it is considered a neutralized threat. Of concern are the cavernous areas beneath the infected settlements that were discovered during the exploration, and attempts to get research personnel into these areas are underway. Item Number SCP-617 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-617 is to be kept in a soundproof container at all times. When in storage, SCP-617 must be kept in its soundproof containment cell and its mouth kept zipped at all times, except for experiments and scheduled feeding periods. All personnel entering SCP-617's containment area must wear hearing protection devices as a precautionary measure. SCP-617 cannot be taken from its containment cell without approval from a Level 4 researcher, and must always be kept within its secure container when being moved. In the event of a containment breach, SCP-617 must be retrieved by personnel with proper hearing protection. The entire sector must be locked down, and all personnel thoroughly searched until SCP-617 is contained. Description SCP-617 has the appearance of a large granite rock, except that it possesses a zipper in its side that is fully operational. When unzipped, SCP-617 is shown to possess a mouth with teeth that appear similar in appearance and construction to human teeth. X-ray and MRI scans of SCP-617 appear to be unable to penetrate its stone exterior. Similar tests to try and probe SCP-617's internal systems have likewise proven inconclusive. SCP-617's mouth is fully functional and can vocalize sounds as well as be used to consume food. SCP-617 is also capable of limited movement, being able to roll around under its own power. However, SCP-617's most disturbing aspects are its parasitical tendencies, 
as well as its ability to influence human behavior. In addition to being able to speak, SCP-617 can generate a low-frequency sound that allows it to exert subliminal control over any human that hears it. Humans affected by SCP-617 will become emotionally attached to it, treating it as a pet and actively caring for it to the best of their ability. As long as they are affected by SCP-617, victims will make SCP-617's care a priority, giving it a home, protecting it from danger, and most importantly, making sure it is well fed. SCP-617 has an active digestive system and sustains itself on a diet primarily consisting of fresh meat. Since it is unable to obtain food on its own, SCP-617 persuades its owner to gather food. The owner will then resort to any means to feed SCP-617. Recorded instances have shown that owners are willing to slaughter livestock and other pets to feed SCP-617, and will even resort to murdering other human beings. In times of desperation, it is not uncommon for the owner to feed parts of themselves to SCP-617. The violent and unpredictable behavior exhibited by owners while obtaining food is believed to be a side effect of SCP-617's subliminal manipulation, which directly affects areas of the brain believed responsible for rational thought. On some occasions, SCP-617 will actually begin to devour its owner while they are asleep. The owner will either not notice the attack, or simply show no alarm when it is discovered, continuing to care for SCP-617 as if this behavior were perfectly normal. However, once the owner is separated from the low-frequency sound SCP-617 produces, they will eventually begin to recover from its effects though victims are still vulnerable to relapse if exposed to SCP-617 again. Further research has shown that zipping up SCP-617 completely neutralizes its ability to produce any sound. However, it still requires feeding, and is still capable of limited movement, being able to slowly roll itself along even ground. SCP-617 is also sapient, possessing average intelligence, and capable of human speech. However, in all attempts to communicate, SCP-617 is incapable or unwilling to discuss anything further than basic conversation. It will, however, state its desire to feed and attempt to persuade any individuals with an earshot to care for it. As such, a standard IQ test is impossible to carry out. The Foundation was made aware of SCP-617's existence after a series of serial murders began exhibiting a pattern to the effect that all of the victims were partially devoured. The Foundation involved itself in the investigation and managed to track the suspect to his home. During the operation, SCP-617's persuasive powers were discovered and it was successfully contained. After Action Report 617, Agent M was sent to apprehend for possible SCP possession. However, all contact was lost. A Foundation armed response team was sent to investigate. They discovered that Agent M had become hostile and initiated a confrontation. Both Agent M and were killed in the ensuing gunfight, with the response team suffering three wounded. At this point, a psychic or memetic factor was suspected and the response team was ordered to stay back and form a defensive perimeter. Remote probing of the area revealed an anomalous, low-frequency sound being generated. D-Class personnel with hearing protection were able to recover SCP-617. Forensic analysis of R***'s home revealed that he had been in possession of SCP-617 for at least six months. During that period, he had systematically fed his entire collection of pets to SCP-617, slowly cutting them apart while they were still alive. When he had run out of pets, he moved on to humans, starting the string of serial murders that were initially investigated. An autopsy revealed a number of human bite marks on his body, with two fingers, six toes, and roughly six ounces of flesh missing. 
Dental analysis showed that the bite marks were a perfect match for the SCP-617's teeth. Autopsies of the murder victims corroborated SCP-617's capabilities. At this time, it is unknown how long SCP-617 has existed. There must be an expanded emphasis on analyzing serial murder cases that involve cannibalization of corpses, as well as similar sociopathic behaviors. Addendum 1 Since the acquisition of SCP-617, two more instances of it were discovered and contained. The Foundation now has SCP-617-1, SCP-617-2, and SCP-617-3 in containment. All three SCPs have been put in the same cell in order to observe patterns such as reproduction, communication, and competition. Administrative Note In light of recent events, all testing with SCP-617 is restricted to human test subjects and non-sapient lifeforms only. 05 Item Number SCP-618 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-618 has been purchased by Foundation Assets and sealed off from the public. The doors and windows of the property have been reinforced as a security measure against outside intrusion. Motion sensors have been installed both for this reason and to monitor the anomaly itself. Description SCP-618 is a one-bedroom apartment unit in Kamloops, British Columbia. The suite displays signs of chronic disuse. Extensive dust and webbing accumulations are visible on the furniture. Housing records indicate that the unit belonged to Anna Leclerc, a photographer previously employed by a Vancouver paparazzi agency. Prior to SCP-618's discovery, Leclerc had already been missing for several months, but had not been reported as such until the expiration of their lease. The contents of SCP-618, while in gross disarray, are generally unremarkable. However, Unusual alterations have been made to the kitchen oven. The porcelain paneling of the oven's interior, as well as its steel racks, have been disassembled and removed from their frame. The hinges of the oven door have been jammed, preventing it from closing. A streak of dried blood runs vertically inside the door, trailing towards a crawl space in the back of the oven. The crawl space serves as an entry point to SCP-618's spatial anomaly, a vast, unlit area that surrounds the apartment. From within this space, the walls of the apartment are completely transparent, allowing observers to view the interior. This effect only occurs on one side. The walls are opaque when viewed from certain angles, or when viewed from inside the apartment. Wall-mounted objects, furniture pieces, and other obstructive features also exhibit the same effect. A massive network of webbing hangs above SCP-618. These webs extend outward for an indeterminate distance, spanning kilometers without terminating. Suspended within the webbing are numerous photographs, each dated with a handwritten label. These photographs vary widely in content, but typically focus on SCP-618's previous occupant, Anna Leclerc, as the subject of depiction. A majority of the photographs are high-angle shots of Leclerc in their apartment, taken from vantage points outside SCP-618's walls. These images generally depict Leclerc and their day-to-day -day activities, seemingly unaware of the photographer's presence. Notably, certain shots offer a closer view of the subject, showing close-ups of their face or being taken directly behind them. A catalog of recovered photographs can be found in Addendum 1. The exact number of photographs inside SCP-618 is currently unknown. However, trend analysis of the photographs marked dates indicate that at least several years worth of pictures are contained within the anomaly. An average of 50 to 100 photos were taken every day spanning the entirety of Leclerc's stay up until their disappearance. No photos have been dated beyond this point, suggesting that the photographs have ceased to manifest. An inquiry into the disappearance of Anna Leclerc 
is currently ongoing. Addendum 1. Recovered photographs. Abridged. Photograph. Image number 618-00617-04-13-2019. Description. Leclerc is seated at her kitchen table, eating soup. The preceding sequence of photographs show her retrieving a Tupperware container from her fridge, transferring its contents into a bowl, then heating it in the microwave. The photograph is a high-angle shot, taken from behind the kitchen ceiling. The hanging light fixture terminates in front of the photographer's point of view, where the plane of the ceiling would normally lie. Photograph Image number 618-05572-06-22-2019 Description Leclerc is sleeping in her bed. The lights in the bedroom are turned off. The photograph was captured at eye level and from within Leclerc's bedroom closet. Of note is that the closet's contents are completely opaque when viewed from outside the apartment's walls. Photograph Image number 618-08651-09-10-2019 Description Leclerc is washing herself behind a glass shower door, covered in condensation. The angle and position of the photograph's point of view indicates that it was captured directly inside the bathroom. Leclerc appears to be unaware of this. Photograph Image number 618-10455-11-30-2019 Description Leclerc is lifting up the blinds of a window and looking outside. The photograph is a close-up shot of Leclerc from behind. Photograph Image number 618-11177-1208-2019 Description the interior of the oven. Context is currently unknown. No photographs have manifested beyond this date. Addendum 2. Subsequent Investigations An investigation was conducted at Anna Leclerc's place of previous employment, a paparazzi agency based in Vancouver. The company's records indicated that most of Leclerc's photographs were regularly met with dissatisfaction and rejected from publication. Despite multiple outbound emails threatening the termination of Leclerc's employment, internal memos strongly recommended for her to be retained, citing her value as a company asset. A full inspection and inventory of the agency's office led to the discovery of a hidden compartment behind a wall. Contained within the compartment were several leather binders covered in thick webbing. Each binder held hundreds of photographs similar to the ones found in SCP-618 in terms of both content and subject matter. Most notably, each binder contained a collection of photographs depicting a different person. A re-evaluation of SCP-618's effects is currently pending approval, following a comprehensive survey of missing persons cases in British Columbia. Item Number SCP-620 Object Class Safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-620 is not considered a direct hazard as such. Its containment procedures exist to create an environment where researchers can study its effects without being exposed to them. SCP-620 is to be mounted to a large two-way mirror, separating an observation area from the testing area. It is to be attached to the mirror by suction cup mounts. In the event of suction cup failure, the testing area must be evacuated until SCP-620 can be remounted. Research personnel may remount the object, as brief exposure is not considered dangerous. SCP-620 is currently connected directly to Site's power supply. Following incident SCP-620... Any signs of wires needing repair must be reported to Site maintenance staff immediately. Description SCP-620 is an analog clock of unknown make and model. It bears no markings indicating a manufacturer or place of origin. Its face is styled after the yellow smiley face design. When SCP-620 is powered, 
All subjects observing its face experience perceived time acceleration. Constant observation is not required. Occasional glances will induce the perceived acceleration as quickly as constant observation. Upon the conclusion of a testing session, test subjects were asked to gauge how much time they thought they had spent testing. All underreported time spent testing by a factor proportional to time spent exposed to SCP-620. Subjects exposed to SCP-620 for under five minutes were no less accurate at measuring time than a control group. However, as exposure length increases, inaccuracy rises proportionally. Most subjects experience its effects to be pleasurable. As of incident SCP-620, indiscriminate exposure to the object is no longer permitted, and the object has thus been relocated to a specialized research area. The perceived time acceleration only persists as long as the object remains functional. If SCP-620 loses power, or its hands cease movement for any reason, all subjects exposed to it will experience time dilation in equal proportion to the time acceleration perceived when it is functional. All subjects, especially those previously perceiving time acceleration, find the time dilation uncomfortable, and after prolonged exposure, it becomes unbearable for most test subjects. SCP-620 consumes battery charge at varying and unpredictable levels, causing it to lose power with little warning. As such, SCP-620 currently draws power directly from Site-9's power supply. Prolonged exposure to the object in either state is unsafe. After 24 continuous hours of exposure, subjects have, in the past, begun to reject food regardless of hunger, frequently stating that they just ate, regardless of how much actual time has passed since the subject has eaten. Subjects become overconfident in their recollection, claiming to remember things as if they were yesterday, but with no measurable increase in recall. Subjects who become aware of how quickly they perceive time to be passing have been chronically depressed, believing their death to be imminent. Subjects exposed to a stopped face for prolonged periods quickly become extremely bored, often pleading with researchers through the mirror for the test to end. It is important to remember that SCP-620 has no effect whatsoever on the actual flow of time, as far as Foundation equipment can detect. The acceleration and dilation are completely psychosomatic. Subjects who do not know what an analog clock is, or how to read one, are unaffected by SCP-620. Item Number SCP-621 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All instances of SCP-621 are to be kept in the Site-16 greenhouse and watered regularly. Seeds and pollen from SCP-621 are not to be released into the wild. No instances of SCP-621 are to be released for commercial trade, given as gifts, used as props, used as bribes, or stored in personnel offices. Personnel are advised to not look in SCP-621 for extended periods of time. Addendum 621-3 Personnel are advised not to look at SCP-621 through sunglasses, which has recently been shown to increase SCP-621's mental effects. Only unfiltered lab goggles may be worn around SCP-621. It should be of additional note that unfiltered lab goggles lab glass, or other transparent obstructions will not shield SCP-621's effects. Any instances of SCP-621 found in the wild are to be exterminated immediately. Any instances of SCP-621 found in public are to be confiscated, and whoever in possession at the time be taken in for questioning. Civilians actively watering SCP-621 in the wild are to be detained and the instances of SCP-621 to be confiscated. Be warned that some may use physical force in order to protect SCP-621. Cross-pollination of SCP-621 species will require clearance from command-level personnel. No cross-pollinations may be done for personal reasons. Description SCP-621 is a series of highly invasive flowering plants 
originally released by Flower Shop, that have been in the Foundation's possession as of these plants, mainly the plant species Didier's tulips, Tulipa jasneriana, are naturally bioluminescent, powered by water and other nutrients. These plants glow a variety of colors, though most instances glow purple, blue, or green. This bioluminescent effect can be best seen at night or in a dark area. The effect is only active while the plants are alive. SCP-621, particularly its glow, seems to have a hypnotizing effect on humans, with numerous requests by personnel to store them in their personal offices, all of which have been denied. SCP-621 has varying effects on other animals. When exposed to bees, hummingbirds, or cross-pollinating animals, all of the animals subjected have been preferred spreading the pollen of SCP-621 as opposed to other flowering plants, and due to its bioluminescence, are capable of doing this at night, increasing its rate of reproduction. However, when exposed to herbivores, such as deer or rabbits, all of subjected animals have actively avoided SCP-621. With a high fertility rate, a natural defense against predators, and a hypnotizing effect on humans, SCP-621 can be deemed a highly effective invasive species. Addendum 621-4 Upon further testing, SCP-621's pollen gives off a strong aroma. SCP-621 is completely hypoallergenic, and when personnel with allergies are exposed to up to 5 grams of SCP-621's pollen, personnel displayed no allergic reactions. When placed around other plants, SCP-621 supersedes the nutrients provided to other plants in order to fuel its bioluminescence. As a result, SCP-621 quickly drains the soil of nutrients and requires more water than all other plants in the Site-16 greenhouse. Before being actively monitored by the Foundation, SCP-621 had uprooted multiple farming pastures, but because of its hypnotic qualities, nothing had been done to stop them. In addition, sympathizers actively watered the invading plants during their incursions. Although government agencies such as the USDA and EPA protect against these sorts of invasive species, said agencies have actively defended SCP-621 at the expense of commercial farmers. It may be of note that these farmers have since accepted the situation, citing SCP-621's aesthetic superiority to their own crops and their desire to protect SCP-621. The Foundation stepped in when SCP-621 began invading National Wildlife Preserve, threatening several instances of both endangered plants and animals. The EPA refused to hinder the spread of SCP-621, despite the existential risk to plants and animals, on the grounds that it would have made the National Wildlife Preserve more aesthetically pleasing. Although Didier's tulips, Tulipa jasneriana, are the most common type of SCP-621, there also exist species of SCP-621 that include other types of tulips, roses, Rosa SPP, and a few instances of lettuce, Lactica SPP, as a result of cross-pollination. However, no D-Class personnel could bring themselves to eat SCP-621, worried about possible side effects. When force-fed, SCP-621 induces intense anxiety and paranoia on the subject, but no other side effects. This anxiety dissipates upon digestion. This effect has been seen on multiple test subjects. Addendum 621-1 In light of Dr. Z's public apology for hoarding several instances of SCP-621 in his personal office, personnel are no longer allowed to keep any instances of SCP-621 in their offices. Note, to everyone asking me to ask the administration to release SCP-621 to the public, this is the very reason we're keeping SCP-621 here. I don't care if it looks cool or if I had a few in my office for a while. I know firsthand that this thing has some kind of hypnotizing effect on people, 
and something is telling me that this plant has possibly evolved for that very purpose. If our own government agencies won't stop these things, we will. Dr. Z. Item Number SCP-623 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-623 is located in the Annex of University. The entrance to SCP-623 is to be guarded by two Level 3 security personnel at all times. In-room monitoring must take place every hour for no longer than five minutes. Extended observation of SCP-623 is done from an external observation room through remote monitoring devices. Personnel operating within the observation room are required to switch out every five minutes. An additional Level 3 security guard is required to escort any observers out of the observation room and must not enter until needed. All personnel subjected to SCP-623 for longer than five minutes are to be taken for psychological re-evaluation, regardless of direct or indirect exposure. No photos, videos, or sound recordings are permitted near SCP-623. Sketch drawings and mock-ups must be approved by command-level personnel before being released. All photos, mock-ups, or recreations of SCP-623 are to be destroyed immediately. SCP-623 may safely come into contact with room-altering SCPs, as any major alterations to the room neutralizes SCP-623's effect. However, room-altering SCPs will still carry their same inherent dangers. Addendum 623-1 All testing on individual subjects may last no longer than six hours. Security monitoring observing personnel are now required to remove observing personnel before the fifth minute has elapsed, possibly earlier if needed. Description SCP-623 is a room of roughly 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven meters, built in 1960 by Dr. H. D., a biochemical professor at University, built as part of Data Expunged. Dr. D was subsequently arrested for his activities, but not before his students and followers began making copies of the room. As of 2000, at least recreations of SCP-623 have been found across college campuses. The room is quite large and consists of the following objects. One blue couch. One red couch. One green couch. One white beanbag chair. One circular table emulating a color wheel. Seven chairs surrounding aforementioned table. Seven multicolored lighting fixtures. All of the furniture is arranged in a unique mathematical-based pattern, coinciding with the patterns on both the walls and floor. All of the furniture has been nailed to the floor, most likely prior to painting. Because of the high ceilings, the eye is naturally drawn up to the psychedelic patterns on the walls. The arrangement of the furniture, the patterns surrounding the room, and their combined acoustics have a profound effect on mental behavior, regardless if the affected observer is deaf or blind. These effects extend through remote monitoring devices, still photos, and audio recording devices. Upon entering SCP-623, Personnel have described a feeling of relaxation. After three minutes from entering SCP-623, personnel are incapable of violence, becoming docile and harmless. For the effects after five minutes, refer to document number 623-1. Due to the room's pacifying effects, all attempts at removing the furniture are futile. Exiting SCP-623 exhibits inverse withdrawal effects. Immediately after observation has stopped, observers will feel an intense jolt back to the outside world, which becomes significantly stronger over time spent inside. Other side effects vary over time. Upon leaving SCP-623 within one minute of entering, personnel have reported feeling uneasy, jittery, and slightly paranoid. After leaving SCP-623 three minutes from entering, personnel have exhibited anxiety, fear, 
and in worst cases, depression. For effects after five minutes, refer to document number 6231. Document number 6231. Effects of entering and exiting SCP-623 after five minutes or longer. Test number one, five to ten minutes. Test subject. Subject D-251, male Hispanic, 31 years old, 101 kilograms, 180 centimeters. Observed behavior within SCP-623. After five elapsed minutes, subject D-251 seen giggling and mumbling slurred phrases. After six elapsed minutes, D-251 begins hugging white beanbag chair, declaring his love for it repeatedly. After seven elapsed minutes, D-251 requested various junk foods over the remote monitoring devices. The request was denied. After eight minutes elapsed time, D-251 began to dance around, singing what could possibly be identified as a 60s folk song. From nine to ten minutes in, the subject continued staggering around, laughing. Observed behavior upon exiting SCP-623. Subject D-251 seen actively yelling at staff and threatening violence upon leaving SCP-623. D-251 punched Agent S and was quickly restrained. In detainment, D-251 was observed crying and screaming on the floor, threatening suicide. The bouts of intense rage and intense despair lasted for the next three days. D-251 was transferred off-site. Test number two, 30 minutes to an hour. Test subject, subject D-252, male Caucasian, 28 years old, 77 kilograms, 174 centimeters. Observed behavior within SCP-623. Subject D-252 displayed similar behavior to Subject D-251, with only minor differences for the first 10 minutes. After 20 minutes, the subject began to look flush, exhibiting symptoms not too dissimilar from sexual activity. Subject complained of being thirsty and hungry. Due to safety concerns and to avoid a retest, D-252 was given two liters of brand soda with a large pepperoni pizza and brand onion ring flavored snacks. Subject ate food relatively quickly, forgot what he was doing halfway through, staggered around laughing for the next five minutes, and continued eating. At 40 minutes elapsed time, subject repeated the word indubitably in different inflections and accents. This continued for the next seven minutes. Agent P, who was observing at the time, began to laugh along with D-252 before being forcefully replaced by Agent G. Upon removal, Agent P threatened to quit and expose the Foundation out of anger, but was safely detained and recovered in the next three days. Near the end of the first hour, Subject D-252 began to remove shirt, pants, all undergarments, and proceeded to observed behavior upon exiting SCP-623. Immediately after leaving SCP-623, Subject D-252 began to scream violently and spastically attack its escorts. D-252 was restrained and detained. Upon being released into its cell, the subject began to claw his own face off in horror, screaming about how he still sees it without his eyes. Subject was then placed in restraints for the remainder of observation to ensure he could no longer harm himself or others. Subject did not recover for nearly two weeks and was later transferred off-site. Test number three, one day. Test subject, subject D-253, male Caucasian, 35 years old, 118 kilograms, 198 centimeters. Additional information should include that Subject D-253 was previously charged with serial murder, animal cruelty, data expunged. Their psychological evaluation showed an additional history of sociopathy and regular outbursts of anger. Observed behavior within SCP-623. 
Subject D-253 was escorted into the room in a full-body restraint. Upon entering, the subject, who had previously threatened to kill Agent S, as soon as he got out of the restraints, began apologizing profusely. Before the first five minutes elapsed, D-253 began to engage Agent S in a conversation of a sophomoric manner. Agent S was escorted out of the room quickly, displaying a headache and emotional turmoil upon leaving. Subject D-253 exhibited the behavior of the previous test subjects and was given the appropriate food and water to last through the test. By the second hour, the subject requested to use a latrine. The request was denied, but Agent G was able to bring the necessary equipment into the room without disrupting its effects. By the fifth hour, the subject's behavior deteriorated into repetitive fidgeting and incoherent rambling. Subject suspected to be hallucinating. Subject fell asleep around six hours elapsed time. Subject later awoke 12 hours later, having great difficulty standing back up. D-253 spent the next six hours laughing and babbling on the floor before being escorted out. Observed behavior upon exiting SCP-623. Upon leaving, subject D-253 began to convulse shortly before the autopsy of subject D-253 proved useless as observed behavior upon exiting SCP-623. Upon leaving, Subject D-253 began to convulse, shortly before collapsing to the ground and expelling all bodily fluids. In addition, Subject D-253 lost his hair, eyes, teeth, finger, and toenails. The autopsy of Subject D-253 proved useless, as there was no organic matter left to study. Studying Subject D-253's bodily fluids also proved futile, as there was no cell life to be found. Addendum 623-2 It is unknown what causes after six hours within SCP-623, but it may be part of the room's effects on the body itself. Item number SCP-635 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures All volumes of SCP-635-1 are to be kept in a dedicated library room at site with a climate-controlled environment maintaining a constant 13 degrees Celsius and a humidity of between 35% and 45%. HVAC systems shall use HEPA filtration to keep atmospheric contaminants to a minimum. Lighting exposure to contained objects shall be limited to 50 lux a day. Experiments on original volumes of SCP-6351 are discouraged due to their fragility and will only be approved in an attempt at recovery of lost data. A digital copy of the text of SCP-6351 is available in standard encrypted format for research purposes with Level 3 approval. Personnel exposed to SCP-6351's text must be quarantined on site until all symptoms of exposure cease, generally 72 hours after exposure. Such personnel must only be provided with tools and or equipment as part of a controlled experiment in a secure environment. Instances of SCP-635-2 and SCP-635-3 are to be contained in secure rooms with armored walls and disassembled when no longer being used for testing. Any instance of SCP-635-4 or greater is to be treated as an imminent containment breach and be neutralized immediately via Procedure Capic Omega-635. Description SCP-635-1 is a set of illuminated manuscripts dating from the 13th century recovered by Dr. H. S. of University from the ruins of the Monastery in Ireland in August of 18... The manuscripts came into Foundation custody 36 years later in 19... A decade after Dr. S's dismissal from the university for data expunged. Upon investigating those reports, Foundation agents discovered the main building of the estate partially disassembled. In addition to SCP-635-1, agents recovered inert instances of SCP-635-2, inert instances of SCP-635-3, 
and several rusted pieces of machinery that may have been an attempt at constructing an instance of SCP-635-4. SCP-6351 is written in a combination of Latin and a previously unknown script that relies on numerical and logical elements similar to a modern computer programming language. The first volume is a primer in Latin, introducing the various elements of this script, and as the text progresses, the Latin is slowly displaced until the second volume is almost entirely in this novel language. The volumes increase in complexity until by volume the text consists of solid blocks of numerical data that has undergone an extremely efficient compression algorithm. If a subject with a rudimentary understanding of Latin begins reading Volume 1 of SCP-6351, they will experience a growing reluctance to discontinue that is proportional to their general intelligence, reading comprehension, problem-solving aptitude, and mathematical ability. Those with computer science or engineering degrees seem most susceptible. If the subject is allowed to continue reading, they will finish the first volumes of SCP-6351 in approximately 12 hours. Note: Post-exposure interviews reveal that long-term retention of material read during this period is minimal. When asked to explain what they've read afterward, most subjects only report a general impression of something, quote, really cool. End quote. After completing the first volumes of SCP-6351, subjects will enter a fugue state where they will stop reading and immediately search for tools and material to start construction of an instance of SCP-635-2. Note: Post-exposure interviews reveal that subjects are conscious and aware during this period and report that they felt a strong desire to, quote, try some of this stuff out, end quote. Design and materials used in the construction of SCP-6352 will vary based on the aptitude of the subject and materials and tools available. However, SCP-6352 will always be built with a method to input the text of volume of SCP-6351. Subject will continue to construct SCP-6352s and inputting SCP-6351's text to the best of their ability until succumbing to exhaustion. If appropriate tools and materials are not available, this fugue state subsides, but the subject will feel a strong compulsion to make a backup copy of SCP-6351's text for safekeeping. Note, in this instance, it is recommended to allow subject to make an archive copy of the digital file to cite secure on-site data warehouse. Failure to do this may result in a security breach. Instances of SCP-6352 are robots with varying means of manipulation and data storage. About 50% of instances constructed prove to be viable and autonomous. If an SCP-6352 built by a subject proves viable, it will immediately begin construction of another SCP-6352 based on its own design. Copies tend to be imperfect and have flaws and about 80% of tests have ended with less than three viable SCP-6352s before the machines run down and become inert. In the percent of cases where more than viable SCP-6352s have been created, the SCP-6352s will change behavior and build an instance of SCP-6353, a substantially more advanced robot that will have the capability of retrieving data from the remaining volumes of SCP-6351. Once it retrieves what data it can, an SCP-6353 is able to organize and direct SCP-6352s and prevent them from prematurely powering down. Left unchecked, SCP-6353 will disassemble elements of the surrounding environment for raw material for more robots. Once two or more viable SCP-6353s are active, all robots will begin assembly of SCP-6354. A viable SCP-6354 will data expunged, and it is unclear if this is due to hostile intent or from data corruption to the content of SCP-6351 due to age. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, Subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.